start the recording. So welcome people on YouTube and also on Moodle. Um, I've recently started to upload all of the um, lectures to YouTube as well. So welcome YouTube. Um, I'm hoping that that will catch on and I can make a shit ton of money on YouTube and I become YouTube famous. Uh, I don't think that that will happen, but um, I have to have a thousand followers on YouTube actually before I can get like a cent from them, which is <laughs> strange, um, but that doesn't matter. So stream will start soon? No, we already started. So today we will be doing algorithms and functions. Um, so algorithms and functions, I put in this lecture because last week we had statistical testing and next week we will have more statistical testing. Um, but since I don't want to talk about statistics the whole time, I want to talk a little bit higher level about programming and introduce you to some concepts which are very general and not so much exclusive to R. Um, but I will show you how you can do them in R, um, so that, that will be interesting. Um, and I adapted it from a previous lecture that I gave at King's College in the UK. Um, so today we will do the answers to the exercises, of course, um, and then I will have a little bit of demotivation for you guys, or a little bit of motivation, since we're halfway. Um, so if you need a little bit of motivation, then that's that's possible. And if you need a little bit of demotivation because you're too excited about the lectures, uh, that's perfectly fine. And then we will go uh, and do a lot of theory um, because the, the theory is is things that I can ask questions about because I know that people don't like to write down program programming er, or programs on paper when we do the exam. Um, it's much nicer to answer questions. Um, so to have questions, we have to talk about things like algorithms and design patterns, um, what is recursion, what are higher order functions, um, and then some more exercises about recursive functions, which I think is always interesting. All right, so let's start and I will go to my Notepad++ window because we want to do the answers to um, lecture number six. So lecture number six was kind of a difficult one, I think. Um, during the Tuesday um, talk, um, we had a lot of um, questions about some fundamental things. Um, and I, I hope that I will be able to remember all of the kind of things that people ran into. Um, and of course, if you have questions or something like that, then um, just directly throw them in the chat, right? Then, then I can help you guys. So um, again, like I always do, I start off by writing down what the file is for, right? So always remember to add a header to your file so you know what's in the file, uh, when you modified it, when you first wrote it, who owns the copyright through the file. Um, so the, the other thing that I generally structure is that, so my, my files start with the headers, then if I am using libraries or external packages in R, uh, then I always start with the library calls. So that people that open up the file or, and want to use the code can directly see, oh, I need to have these six packages installed, right? It's not an absolute requirement, but it's just nicer for the people that, that use your code. Um, because they can see, oh, I need five packages so I can install them instead of having them go through the script and then, then at line 100, they have to install a package. So I try to do this, this kind of above the set working directory because you don't need a working directory to install a package. Um, then I set my working directory to where I've stored my files and today we are going to use two files, one of them which is called array data and the other one is called arrays. Um, so this was the way that I loaded them in. Um, of course, you you can load them in in a different way. I'm using the read table function, you can use the read CSV function as well. Um, the only thing that you have to kind of be aware of is that you have to set the check names to false when reading the array data. Um, because there are some names which are not proper variable names, um, so setting check names to false will keep them as is. All right, so let's load in and let's go to R. Oh, I already loaded in a little bit, so. Let's just hide that for you guys, because I, I, I wanted to make sure that I had the library installed. Um, so first off, I want to talk to you a little bit about the, uh, about the files that I gave you. Um, so the array data contains microarray data, because we discussed microarrays last time. So the array data uh, looks like this. So you have the name of the probe on the array. So GE bright corner is the positive control. So that is a sequence which is always available, so it should be kind of 100% on. 
Um, then you have the dark corner. The dark corner is the corner which doesn't have a probe, so it should always be off. It's our negative control. And then we start off with the probes, and the probe has these kind of cryptical names saying A55P something. Um, and this is the sequence that is targeted by this probe. So this is the sequence which is located on the microarray. And then of course we have the different samples. Um, and for each of the samples we have the intensity value. So the raw intensity value as read out by the array. Furthermore, we have our arrays file, and I realize that it's a little bit stupid of me to call one of the variables array data and the other one arrays because they are very similar. Um, but the arrays file looks like this. Um, so they have the file name, and this is the original file name or the file that we got from the company, right? Because we don't do these things here in our own lab. We send away like DNA um, or we send away RNA. Uh, to a company and they do the microarrays because we don't have the equipment here. Um, then you have the Atlas ID, so the Atlas ID is the ID of the company, so the company is called Atlas. Um, then you have the strain, so strain stands for what type of mouse it was in this case. Um, so we have a mouse called BFMI, which is the Berlin Fat Mouse Inbred line, um, and there are a couple more, so if we look to the whole file, right, um, then we can see that there are also B6N, and B6N is the standard laboratory mouse. That's just some extra info. And F1 here is called, uh, it's, a, it's a cross between the Berlin Fat Mouse and the B6 mouse. And then the tissue column contains the different tissues on which they were measured. Um, so HT stands for hypothalamus, and individual is the individual ID, so this is the ID of the mouse in the mouse house. So we see that, for example, from this individual we took hypothalamus, and from this individual we also took gonadal fat. Um, so and the individual IDs can be repeated, and that just means that you took two tissues from a single animal. All right, so those are the two files that we have, and now we will start doing some analysis. So let's go back to the assignment. So the first thing that I wanted you guys to do and ask you to do is make a box plot to show kind of the distribution of the data. Um, so the way that I do this, um, if we look at the R window quite quickly, right? If we look at the file here, um, so the array data, um, we have this sequence column that we need to get rid of. So there's two ways of doing this and both of them are valid um, because we can't make a box plot of sequence data right because sequences are characters and, and a box plot needs numerical values um, so we can only use the, the real measurement values so the way that I did that um, in here is just saying that I use array atlas ID right so this is the column that has the company ID and all of these are occurring in array data. So I'm selecting here only the columns of array data which have numerical values in them. And then I just say box plot because box plot just goes through the columns and plots the columns as a box plot one by one. So how does that look? Well, if we look here and we go back to the R window, um, then if we just do the basic box plot, um, it, it takes a while and we will soon see why it takes a while. Um, and let me actually do LAS equals 2 so that it changes the um, the axis and it takes a while again but now we can read all of the sample names as well at the bottom um, but you can see that like the box is not even visible right there's like massive amounts of outliers or at least that's what it looks like but this is because it's microarray data and microarray data doesn't follow a normal distribution at all or at least the raw data doesn't follow a normal distribution um, yeah, because you have genes which are off and there's a bunch of genes which are off and then there are some genes which are on right in a certain tissue if we look at for example uh, fat tissue more than 60% of genes are off. Yeah, so you see that there's a, there's, there's a big overrepresentation of, of zero intensity or very low intensities in our data set. And then of course you have genes which are on. Um, so, hey, but that is the minority. So it's not a normal distribution at all. So we have to remember that and we have to start dealing with that as well. Um, so just to, uh, just to have that clear. Um, we see here the different uh, the HT stands, of course, for one tissue again. Then we have the animal IDs at attached to it. Um, and we can now also read them. So that's what the LAS is 2 does. Um, the LAS is 2, it just rotates the axis 90, 90 degrees. So you can see um, 
or you can better read them in this case. So the first thing that we want to do um, to the array data is to do the log2 normalization. Um, so for the log2 normalization I use the apply function so and again like this is the part of the array which has the data so I just repeat this right so from the array data select the columns which are in the arrays atlas ID and then apply to that to the columns to two a log2 transformation and then I directly just assign this back into the same columns. So I'm taking the columns out, doing a log2 transformation column by column, and then I put the whole matrix back in from where I took it. So I directly overwrite my data. And this is of course a destructive, um, a destructive operation because I overwrite the old values. And generally I don't like doing that, but since the data size is relatively big, um, I'm going to use destructive operations every time. Which means that if I copy paste this line twice, it will do twice the log two, which is of course not what I want. So I have to remember that, that I cannot just restart the script from any point, um, but that I always have to start the script from the beginning, just to make sure that I don't do an operation twice by copying in the, the same code twice. So let's do the log2 transformation and directly make a box plot again. Um, so is it clear why I'm using this system? Um, can anyone in chat actually tell me what I could have done as well um, to kind of get rid of this sequence column? Because there's a much, much easier way of doing this. Um, so, and I will copy paste it in. So if you know, just throw it in chat what what you did or because there's an easier way of getting rid of this sequence column um, so we'll just copy it and then we go to R um, and then we do the box plot and now we can see that the box plot looks already a lot better and this is the same box plot that we saw in the uh, in the uh, assignments so there's no answers everyone's sleeping again I know it's beautiful weather so like I, I don't blame you guys for not giving any answers in chat but it, it would be appreciated if you have Use the subset function. Yeah, that's true, but that's again a big function, right? So the, the thing that I was talking about, which you could have done, um, which um, um, during the last Tuesday discussion came up, was that you can just say array data and just do minus one, right? Throw away the first column and then just save array data. Right, just, just remove the first column. Just say minus one. And that's one of the nice things in R, like this is really something that only R supports. There are no other programming languages in which you can kind of delete a, um, a single thing. I also use subset without the sequence column. Yeah, yeah, you, you, you can do that as well. But in this case, since we only want to get rid of one column, we could just say minus one. And then it will just drop the first column and then we just write it in array data. Of course, from now on, we don't have the sequences anymore, but that's kind of what we want, so. Florian, welcome to the lecture. Why are you not a VIP guy? Why don't you have a nice like diamond in front of your... Uh... That's that's so bad. That's so bad. I don't think my moderator can do that, but I can... Uh, let me see if I can make you a... Uh... If I can make you a... Uh, Florian Eberswalde. All right, there you are, and I'm going to make you a VIP. Welcome, welcome. No VIP, no salary. How do you mean, no salary? Well, I made you a VIP. You can ban him, yeah, no. Well, you just, just mute him for like 60 seconds or something, but he's a VIP now, so he, 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 uh, it should be all fine. All right, so, so this is the same, this, this is something that we could have done as well. So just throw away, but you can use the subset function as well. So uh, that, that's perfectly fine. All right, so what do we see? When we do the log2 transformation, right? And we've just done that. And then we do see, um, let me flip around the axis as well. Then we now see something which is very common. And so we see the microarray data. Every array has a slightly different mean. And this is just because of kind of random, um, random, uh, uh, random noise in the, uh, in, in the microarrays because every time that you scan a microarray, the conditions are slightly different and uh, <laughs> and uh, it, uh, it, it shows you that 
the means are slightly different. But we see something here which is very important and we have to remember for the analysis later on. So for the analysis later on, here we see that the hypothalamus samples, so the, the samples from brain, have a higher average expression than the ones from gonadal fat. So when we do the normalization and we, we give every array the same mean, we are introducing a certain bias, which is which we kind of should not do. Um, and we talk during the Tuesday um, lec or during the Tuesday kind of open discussion, we talked about this and how you could handle this. So when I upload the, the file Moodle, then you guys can see that. Um, but hey, you have to remember that when we normalize now, we are losing some real biological information. And that's of course what we don't want. Because normally when we do normalization, we don't want to lose the fact that in the brain, more genes are on than there are on in fat tissue. So, and that's, that's something that's very fundamental. Um, but we can't really deal with that at this point. So at this point, um, and also the assignments just ask you to do a quantile normalization. Um, so again, I do the same thing. So I take out this part, right? So that's the, that's the part of the array data, which contains data. And then I say as matrix, and I have to say as matrix because um, I have to force it to be of type matrix. Um, and then we just use the normalized quantiles function. So the normalized quantiles function uh, does quantile normalization for us. And again, I just store it back into the array data. So, and then I make a box plot. And after that, there should not be any difference between the different arrays anymore. So we should be, we should be rid of this kind of pattern where some of them are high, some of them are low, some of them have outliers, um, and has some of them have a much, don't have the, the lower corner uh, or the, the dark corner expressed at, at a low level. Um, but has, so when we do this, so we do the normalized quantile function, and then afterwards we see that now every array, it have, they have the same median, um, they have the same quantiles, and they also have no outliers anymore because now everything falls within two standard deviations. So it kind of forces every array to be a normal distribution. And there are advantages of doing this. It makes your statistical testing better, but there are also disadvantages, which we will see further on when we are discussing the rest of the assignments. All right, so let's go back. So the next question was to make 16 plots. Um, and in these plots, what we wanted to do is we wanted to show the correlation of one array versus all the other arrays. So we can do this using a for loop um, or we can do this using an apply. So the apply we did during the Tuesday assignment just to show people how you can do it. Um, but I'm just going to first do the for loop. So first things first, we need to ask for 16 plotting windows. So 16 is nice because it's four by four. So I'm just going to say, set my MF row parameter to be four, four. So that will allow me to do 16 plots in a single window. Then I'm going to say for X in one to the length of the arrays Atlas ID, right? Because the arrays for each row in the array, um, we have the, uh, um, um, for each row we have like the, the, the sample. And so we take out the column Atlas ID. So then we have a vector and the length of this vector is the number of samples that we have. So again, this is 16. Um, so we could have just say for one to 16, but I do like using the length of a vector because in the end we could get more samples later on and then I don't have to adjust the script because the script will just read in um, the uh, annotation file and if the annotation file now contains like 30 animals um, then I don't have to update my code because otherwise I have to go through my code and at every point uh, do a find and replace and replace 16 by 30 and that's something that you don't want. So you always want to make your code depend on input files and not on fixed numbers. So we just go through all of the row or all of the elements in this uh, in this vector. And then what do we do? OK, so this is a big statement. So let's break it down. Right. So um, we do an as numeric. So we want to have numerical values. So we just want to force it. Um, so what do we do? Well, we use the core function to calculate the correlation. And here you're seeing that I'm using this minus X. Right. So like minus one to throw away a column. So here what I'm asking is the correlation. So calculate the correlation between the array data and from array data, take the column X from this Atlas ID, right? So this is the name of the sample that we're going to use to calculate correlation on. So to make it a little bit more clear, I could say um, sample from 
right? So the sample from which we are calculating correlation. So this is the name of the sample from which we are calculating correlation. So, and then what do we do? Well, we do the correlation of this one vector versus the array data. And now I throw away this one sample. So minus X, right? So X here is selecting it and here I'm removing X. So keeping all the other 15. So, and then I just select that from array data. So here I do the correlation from a single vector of uh, like 30,000 measurements versus the array data, which is again 30,000 measurements, but this time it has 15 different uh, columns because I'm throwing away the column that I'm currently looking at. Um, so now I have defined this, so I can then say S from. So I'm calculating the correlation. I'm storing this in a variable called correlation and then you do the plot. So you say plot correlations on the Y label, put correlation, the main. So the title will be the name of the sample that we do the correlation from. I disable plotting of the X legend uh, or of the X label um, and also the X axis because I want to put the names there, right? So the names are um, suppressed and I don't do any tick marks and then I just add my own axis so I say on the first axis so on the x-axis put the names of the samples which I am comparing to and those have to be at one to the length of this thing and of course one to the length of this thing is 15 so it's actually one to 15 and then I do LAS is two because I want to rotate them because I want to see them all right, so I hope that that's clear. So let's run the run it in R so that you guys can see how this looks like. So then we get this one big picture which looks a little bit like this. So on the top we see the sample from which we calculate the correlation and then here we see the other samples without the sample which was used to calculate correlation to. Right, so we, we do correlation from one sample to all the other 15. Um, and what we see here is something that we kind of want to see because we now see that if we look at this hypothalamus sample, right, we see that it is highly correlated with the first three hypothalamus samples. Then there's a drop in correlation towards the gonadal fat samples. And then again, the correlation is high towards the other hypothalamus samples. So this is really good because this gives us an idea that yes, our data, at least for this sample, is okay, right? Because hypothalamus should look more like hypothalamus and gonadal fat should look more like gonadal fat. So if we look at the first gonadal fat sample from the same individual, then we see here the same thing. So we see low correlation with the hypothalamus samples and high correlation with the gonadal fat samples. So that means that at least the company didn't swap one of the individuals yeah, because when you're doing research, it's very easy to mislabel a single sample. Um, so had to do these kinds of quality control plots is very, very important because if you if there's a sample swapped, then you could directly see that, right? Because then one of the hypothalamus samples would be correlated to the gonadal fat sample. And then you would say, oh, something went wrong there. And you could probably even figure out which two samples were swapped with each other. So just a basic quality control plot. All right, uh, not to the PowerPoint. Let's go back to Notepad++. So, and here we have the apply function. If you want to know how we wrote this one, um, it's very similar to this one, um, but um, watch the Moodle. There's the, the one hour um, about talking about how to do this. All right, so the next question was to do kind of another quality control plot where we look at the heat map. So we use the heat map function on the correlation, but now we just say calculate the correlation of each or each column of the matrix to each other column, right? So again, I use this arrays, data, arrays, atlas ID, just to get rid of the first sequence column. So when I do this um, in R, then we get a heat map plot and the heat map plot kind of confirms the thing that we already know, yeah, because here you can also see that our data falls into two major groups. So we see the hypothalamus samples having high correlation to all of the hypothalamus samples. And we see the gonadal fat samples having high correlation to the gonadal fat samples, which is kind of what we want to see, right? One of the nice things that we also start seeing here is that there's a little bit of substructure. 
right? We see that there's like three samples here, which seems to be closer to each other than the other one. So we start seeing that the data falls out, not in just in two groups, but also into kind of subgroups, which when we looked at the array annotation file, we already saw that there were different types of mice, right? We had Berlin fat mice, we had the standard laboratory mouse, and we had a mixture between the two. So we do start seeing also some substructure. But for this plot, hey, when we look at it, the conclusion should be no samples were swapped in our pipeline, right? So when we did the extraction, we put everything in cups, that all went well, we send it to the company, nothing was mixed up by sending it, the company didn't mix anything up. So the data that we have is good, it is reliable. That is the conclusion that we can draw at this point. All right, so the next step was then to um, split the data and do all kinds of um, kind of statistics on the data so more or less descriptive statistics um, so to do this um, the first thing that I wanted to um, do was split the two types of tissue so I'm going to say arrays tissue is hypothalamus then I use this so these this is a true false factor right so for every row in the arrays it will tell me if this sample was hypothalamus yes or no and then I can use this true false factor as the index so I'm only going to take the rows for which the tissue column was hypothalamus I throw it back into the arrays and now I say give me the atlas ID so Hate samples contains the names of the individuals which have hypo uh, which are hypothalamus and then I'm going to say, well, take the array data and now only take out these columns and call them HT, so capital HT. So those are only the samples which are hypothalamus. And then we do the exact same thing for conatal fat. And this is just to make it easier for me, right? I could have kept, I could have kept all of the data into the uh, uh, array data structure or into the array data um, matrix. But I'm just going to subset it. And of course, you could have used the subset function as well. I just like to do this. And this is because generally you don't want to select on one thing, but you want to select on multiple things, right? I might have wanted to select only the BFMI individuals. And then by doing it like this, I could just say N. And then I could just say, well, I want to have the uh, species be BFMI, right? So the subset function is good but I like doing it more or less explicitly because it allows me to to add more things later on yeah, so if I only want to look at the BFMI then it's relatively easy to do it in in this structure you could have done that with the subset function as well but I, I just like being very explicit um, and I use this structure a lot so I, I use it a lot where I say arrays arrays tissue hypothalamus atlas ID Right, and I always read from the inside out. So when I start reading code, I, I always start reading from the inside out. So the first thing that I see here is arrays tissue is hypothalamus. And then, okay, so this is then a selection. And then I say arrays atlas ID. So and now in my mind, I know, okay, so I'm going to go through every row, determine if they're hypothalamus and then take the atlas. So call this HT samples, then I make my subset and I do the same thing for grenadal fat. So let's go to R, let's run this. So just to show you guys that this really works. So now I have my HT samples. Oh, HT with a small letter. And these are the samples which are hypothalamus. Um, you could have used the substring as well. And we discussed during the Tuesday um, seminar that you could use a grep function. Um, so there are multiple ways also of doing this. And all of them are fine. Um, I just do it like this. And this was, this was my, uh, my way of doing it. All right. So then we wanted to calculate the mean for the hypothalamus for each gene. We wanted to calculate the mean for gonadal fat for each gene. We wanted to have the standard deviation for hypothalamus and gonadal fat for each gene. And then we wanted to do a t-test between hypothalamus and gonadal fat to see if there's a difference between them. So um, I do this all in a single for loop. So the first thing that I'm going to do is say I'm going to create something called results. Right, and those will uh, th this thing will contain all of my results. Initially, I have nothing calculated, so I say results equals zero. 
right? I just put something in so that the variable is defined, but now it's a matrix or a vector, but it has no type, it has no structure, there's just nothing in there. But the variable exists, so I can use it for adding things to it. And then I'm just going to say for x in the row names of the array data. So I just go through each of the rows in the array data. And then what am I going to do? Well, I'm going to select the row from the hypothalamus um, and call it ht. And I'm going to select the same row for gonadal fat and call it gf. And then I'm going to calculate and make a vector. Right, so this vector now contains the mean of the hypothalamus samples, the mean of the gonadal fat samples, the standard de deviations, and the t-test between them. And I'm just going to remember the p-value because I'm not really interested in the rest of the of the t-test. Right, like the t-test does a lot of other computations as well. So I'm creating a vector, right, and this vector is called values. So this is a vector which has a length of five. And then what I'm going to do is then say, well, take the results and row bind, so take, take the matrix that we have, which initially is completely empty, and now add a row to the matrix. <laughs> General Gulag, how programmers get a girlfriend? Girlfriend <laughs> equals lots of code. Yeah, I don't know, well, I don't know. Generally, girlfriends programmers are kind of an incompatible thing. Although it used to be more in the 80s, right? You had like these movies like uh, what were they called, like Revenge of the Nerds and stuff? That was crazy time when nerds were not popular. Like I think with, with Bill Gates, nerds became really popular in a way because like lots of money. So and that's I think how a programmer gets a girlfriend is like lots of money because you program so you earn lots of money. Um, but and this is what we're doing. Become a rock star programmer. Yeah, become a 10x programmer. That's, that's what everyone wants. Uh, but and, uh, so... Let's go back to the assignments. Uh, uh, we can talk about Rockstar programming later on. Um, I would say become a streamer programmer. That That's probably like streamers are nowadays, they are the new nerds in a way. Because streaming used to be like a fringe kind of thing. But since people start watching streams more, and especially due to the pandemic, I think that streaming got a big, big boost. So um, become a streamer programmer, like not a rock star, because like then you have to play an instrument or be able to sing, um, which is, I can't. Um, but and so everyone understand 3B? If you have any questions, just ask them, right? Because that's what I'm here for. If there's no questions, then I'm just gonna run it into R um, because it, it will take a while. So we have like a couple of minutes to talk while it does all the computation because we have to do 30,000 times calculating a mean, calculating standard deviations, and then do the t-test, um, which also takes some time. Yeah, but the idea here is we start off with an empty matrix, we calculate the values that we need, and then we row bind this to the matrix. Yeah, and then in the end, what we're going to do is just say, well, the row names of the results are the row names of the array data, because I went through the row names of the array data one by one. And then in the end, um, I also add column names, so I say the mean of hypothalamus, mean of gonadal fat, standard deviations, and the t-test value. All right, so let's run this, and let's go to R, and this will take some time. So this uh, this is something that we can wait for, and um, let me change my moodlet as well. So I'm going back to zombie instead of being a robot. So yeah, if you have any questions, you, you can ask them now while we wait, or I can just sit here a little bit and do like uh... but it's really slow and that's that's just the way that it is because hey, we're doing a lot of computation and of course if you wanted to do something like this in Excel it would be a, it would take a while as well um, because Excel has the same kind of issue um, hey, it's like a lot of rows so we're doing I think 30,000 genes or 50,000 genes even um, so I'm just going to sit here and talk over it a little bit. So anyone got a nice joke? Just throw it in chat. That, uh, no nice jokes? Come on, people. You can do it. I should remember that there's a little bit of a delay with Twitch. So when I ask for a joke, then you only hear that like a minute and a half later. So, Florian, you have a joke. You're, you're a funny guy. A rant is also fine, Florian. I know you like ranting just as much as I do, so. Sure. 
nothing. Then I'm just gonna have like two minutes of dead air that we're just looking at the screen and just waiting. NFSW. That's not suitable for work. That's actually written the wrong way around. Not suitable for work jokes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you can put them in chat. <laughs> I don't have to read them, so, like. Do I have a joke? I don't really have a joke. No, I don't really have a joke. On another note, would it be possible to have the first exam a week later? Uh, probably, but then it wouldn't be on my birthday. But uh, I, I guess that you are busy then, right? On the 15th. I will write it down and I will uh, I will ask the uh, Prüfungsbüro if that is possible. So question, exam on the, that would be the 15 plus 7 is 22nd, right? And that's a bad thing? Oh, do you mean it's a bad thing of having it uh, um, on the 20, on, on my birthday? No, I actually like having it on my birthday because then you can all wish me a happy birthday and because it's the pandemic, then I don't feel so lonely and that's, that's always a good thing, right? Would be ideal for me too. Okay, so there's two people that want to move it. I will, I will, Ask the Prüfungsbüro then if it's possible to move them uh, to move it a week later. Um, General Gulag, my flatmate just dropped half a liter of water over his laptop and just asked for a screwdriver. A screwdriver? Uh, a week later would be the twenty second, but the twenty first would be even better. All right. Um, you know what? I will put a voting on Moodle thing then everyone can vote for their preferred date. Right? Is that, a, is that a deal for everyone? Does everyone think that that would be good? That's a good idea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Then everyone gets a vote, and then we can just pick the date at which most people are available. Uh, good. As the F off. Yes, yes, yes. Good. Okay, then we're going to do that. Um, still running. It takes a long time to do this. I should have done this beforehand. Um, sounds sweet, yeah. All right, then, uh, yeah. So any other suggestions? Because we then need to have some dates that we can put on the vote, um, right? So I will put the 21st, 22nd, also the 15th, because that's my preferred date. But um, if you don't want to spend my birthday with me, then that's fine with me. For every week later, it gets harder. Let's say double the questions every week. No, I'm not going to double the questions. I already have to make 42 questions because I got a birdie whispering in my ears that there are students of this course who are looking for exams from the last couple of years. So that means that I am forced to make completely new exam questions, which I hate doing. Uh, Any time during the week of the 21st would be great. Okay, so now we'll put the whole week uh, and... Uh, on Moodle and then we can vote on it. But yeah, I'm not I'm not too happy about people wanting to have the questions from the like last couple of years. But uh, I think I'm generally pretty good at not giving out the exam questions. When we still did the kind of exam in person, you had to give me back the exam questions plus your answers when leaving the room so that people couldn't take the exam questions with them. And I also always made like 42 questions so that people can't really remember all of the questions and then write them down after the exam. Because I don't like people cheating on exams, but uh, I know that people do, but um, I try to prevent it as much as possible. Um, but uh, I, had, I had someone whisper in my ear that someone is asking other people to uh, do not underestimate a student's ability to remember questions. Is it really an underestimation of students? 
Like if you're smart enough to remember 42 questions, then then you you deserve to have these 42 questions like that you can write them down afterwards, right? And I always change the exams anyway. So the, the questions will be very similar, but not identical. Um, because I, I do want exams to be more or less equally difficult every year. If they had only used that gift to study, yes, yes. If they are smart enough to remember 42 questions, then they could have learned like 16 slides. Because in the end, like the overview lectures, like between 16 and 24 slides or something. Um, and that's more or less everything that I think is important. So, all right, and we're done. Good, good, good. So we're done. So let's look at the results. Um, oh yeah, results. Sweet, sweet results. So here we see that we have the uh, dark corner, the bright corner. You have the bright corner, the dark corner. We have the means, and we have the standard deviations, and then we have the t-test, um, and then for all of the probes, we have the same thing. And when looking at this data, can anyone tell me? why we should be highly suspicious of this data at the moment with all of the things that I told you like uh, w why is when you see a result like this why would you go like yeah I don't know if my experiment went correctly um, why 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 what went wrong what went wrong so uh, you tell me, because I know, like I, I did the experiment, so I, I know what went wrong. And this of course has to do with the stuff that we talked about at the beginning and um, when we were looking at the different arrays. Just gonna have a little bit of dead air because People need to be able to type in their answers as well. And uh, so no one wants to do a guess. Just do a guess. You can do it. Like I, I, I know you know. That. And if not, I'm going to ask Florian because then, then Florian can come up to the board and give his answer. busy oh that's 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 too bad I am clueless all right so um, okay let's let's look at the data right so we look at the bright corner and I told you guys the bright corner is our positive control so what don't you want for your positive control well here we see that in hypothalamus the positive control is 14.0 the gonadal fat is 13.1 positive control then if we look at the t-test value we see that this is a highly significant difference so we see that the positive control between the two tissues is not the same and having a positive control which is differentially expressed between your two conditions that you want to compare is of course a very bad thing your positive control should be the same in tissue one compared to tissue two and that is what's going wrong here. And this has to do with the fact that in hypothalamus there's more genes that are expressed than in, in gonadal fat. But it's not just the amount of genes, it's also that something made the positive control light up more intensely in, in the hypothalamus compared to the gonadal fat. Right? And the, the, the very, very significant p-value, this is 4.5 times 10 to the minus 9, so there is a really, really significant difference between the positive control. And that is something that you never want. You don't want your positive control to be differentially expressed. You see that the negative control is fine, right? So the negative control is not an issue. That's not, it's like 0 0.7. So that's not a significant p-value. But this one is really, really worrisome. Why is the positive control different from one sa or from from one tissue to the other tissue? And that that should make you highly sus suspicious about the rest of the results. Um, but let's go and do the last two assignments so that we're done with the assignments. Um, so the first question was use Bonferroni correction to correct for multiple testing. Sus. Yeah. No, that's very suspicious. That. 
and in this case it's the hypothalamus which is very suspe suspicious um, but yeah, first use Bonferroni correction to see how many genes are differentially expressed so um, Bonferroni correction is easy you take your p-value that you want and then you divide by the number of tests that you did so the thing that I'm going to do is just do that so I'm just going to say 0 0.05 divided by the number of tests that I did which is equal to the number of rows in our result and then I'm just going to compare the t-test p-value so the t-test column of the results and ask which values are lower than this and then I have a TF vector, which is again a true-false vector, right? So for every element in the results, so for every row in the results matrix, it will say it's true or it's false. Um, and then um, what I do is I ask, so there's two ways of doing this. Um, and one of them is just sum them up, right? Because zero is zero or a... a false is zero and true is one so I want to know how many are true so I can just say sum them all up um, but I like to use this this system or I use this system quite often where I ask which ones are true is it also possible to do using the p-adjust yeah you can do the p-adjust as well which we do for the for the second one um, but this is just because it's a little bit more code but it, I think it's a little bit clearer that what you're doing here so taking your p-value dividing and here we're just adjusting and then asking which ones are below 0 0.5 um, but here hey, you get a true false vector you can sum them up or you can ask for the length of which are true so which are true then it gives you the the indexes um, and the length of this is the number of genes which is significantly different um, so let's show you the difference between using Bonferroni correction and using Benjamini Hochberg correction Although we already found out that it's highly suspicious, right? Because there's a difference in the uh, in the bright corner, so in the positive control. Um, but if we do this, then we see um, that if we do Bonferroni correction, it tells us that there are 14,000 genes which are different from fat tissue to hypothalamus tissue. If we do the Benjamini Hochberg correction, it tells us that there are 31,000 genes which are different from the gonadal fat to the hypothalamus. Um, so, and of course, again, these things are highly suspicious because it can't be that more or less all of the genes in the mouse genome are different from gonadal fat to hypothalamus. Hey, although these tissues are relatively different, we would expect things like ribosomes to be not that much different between hypothalamus and gonadal fat. And hey, there's a lot of genes which should not be expressed at all. So those should also not be different. Um, so we get like large numbers. Hey, but the thing here, what you, what you kind of have to learn from this, is that when you do Bonferroni correction, you get less results, but these results are more reliable because hey, there's a higher true positive rate. Benjamini Hochberg gives you more results which are different, but of these results, the true positive rate is lower, but the false negative rate, uh, so th but the true negative rate is, is, is higher. So it's a balance between having, um, having this type 1 versus type 2 error. So hey, Bonferroni optimizes the type 1 error, so if something is different, then you call it, or if something is, is, um, is really different, then it will be found using Bonferroni. Um, and hey, you don't call too many things different while they're actually not. But Benjamini Hochberg is the other way around, so it, it, it allows you to not miss anything which is different. So you accept a little bit more false positives in a way, um, hey, because you want to get the true positives. Um, so that's the difference between using Bonferroni and uh, using Benjamini Hochberg. Um, but hey, Rigoletti, you're true. You could have used, used the p-adjust function also for uh, Bonferroni. All right, so those were the assignments for today. Um, honesty question for you guys. Who did it and who was able to do the assignments? And um, what was your opinion on the assignments? Because this is this is kind of real data, right? This is data that we collected in like three years ago or four years ago, and uh, so it's real data that you're working on. And I know that it's not your own data, and that it might not be exactly what you're used to. But um, 
I think it's better to work on real data than just using some of these built-in data sets in, in R. Um, and, and there's nothing wrong with these data sets, of course, but I just think it's nicer to work at data which either has not been published or has recently been gathered, and so that you can kind of get an idea of, yeah, no, there's really something that we can learn from this. Um, and of course, um, you can create some nice plots uh, along the way. Did it only manage half before Tuesday? That's good, that's good, that's good. Like I think that if you, like for me, if you load it in, right, and you're able to do the correlation plots, the, the first assignments, um, then that's already a whole bunch that uh, had doing the box plots um, had to be able to look at them. And so doing half means that you probably got to like here. Unfortunately, I don't have time to do them at the moment because it takes me up to five hours. Five hours of doing all the questions. Then you should definitely email a little bit earlier for like a couple of tips. That uh, And I'm never too, too, like if you say that, well, I don't exactly understand what you mean by this question, um, then of course, uh, just drop me an email and I can clarify myself. Um, General Gulak, I was on a 10 day uh, field work trip, so no. Are you doing the slave work together with Daniel, who's like, slaving away in the middle of a field near the Tesla factory and why are it why is everyone so busy like just did the first part until 2a didn't have time to finish all right all right well doesn't matter like as long as you tried um, and of course um, spend some time right you can look at my answers then think about okay so how would have how would I have done it and does this kind of overlap um, hey in the end the assignments are there for you to practice we discuss them um, just so that I show you how I would do it but of course there's many different ways how to do this um, and had, don't just say well um, we're done with lecture six or we're done with lecture seven so I'm not gonna look at the uh, I was in lower Saxony okay Interesting. So what kind of a field trip did you have then? Um, yeah, but do try to do the assignment. So if you got to 2A, then spend another like half an hour this weekend um, to do question 2A and, and try to do it yourself. Um, I finished one and two. That's good. That's good. You're such such active student. In general, like when we still had in-person lectures, we would do them more or less together. So we would and we would have like a three-hour lecture or two and a half-hour lecture, and then we would do in in the classroom together. We would do the first couple, um, and we would I would have people would spend like 15, 20 minutes doing one A, um, and then we would discuss one A, and then people would do two A, and then we would discuss it after like 30 minutes. So then and the nice thing about in-person lectures is uh, collecting data for shore vegetation. Oh, nice, nice. So there's a lot of shore vegetation in Lower Saxony. Is there actually a shoreline in Lower Saxony? Is it not completely landlocked? Yeah. Or is it the shore of like a, 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 well, not a seashore probably, probably a lake shore. Yeah, yeah, that's what I thought. If you would do a seashore, you could go to the, the Baltic Sea, which is nicer. It's like the Ozarks. <laughs> so you're saying Lower Saxony is filled with like drug dealers and mob bosses that want to launder a lot of money? I don't think that's Lower Saxony for you, but you never know. You never know. I'm not going to have any opinions on Lower Saxony. <laughs> All right. <laughs> The Süd Saxischen Riviera. Yeah, that sounds good. That sounds good. All right, guys. Um, we've been on it for an hour, so um, I will stop the recording and I will take a little break. Um, 